Members of Congress and distinguished guests, welcome to the Library of Congress and the eighth Henry A. Kissinger Lecture. I'm John Haskell, director of the Kluge Center here at the library. The Kissinger program is made possible by generous donations of the friends and admirers of Dr. Kissinger, who was the 56th Secretary of State of the United States and a recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize. Before we move on, on behalf of all of us at the library, we join America in mourning the passing of former President George H.W. Bush. The Kissinger program celebrates statesmanship and foreign policy. President Bush's legacy of commitment to global diplomacy is in keeping with exactly that tradition. We, we all wish the extended Bush family and his many close friends the best in this difficult time. In a similar vein, we mourn the passing last month of Dr. James Billington, the 13th Librarian of Congress. The Kissinger program is one of, one of his many legacies here at his distinguished career at the library, which spanned 28 years. The Kissinger Lecture has been delivered by heads of state, including former Prime Minister Tony Blair, former President of Mexico Felipe Calderon, former President of Brazil Fernando Enrique Cardozo, former President of the French Republic Valérie Giscard d'Estaing, as well as former United States Secretaries of State James Baker, George Schultz, and Dr. Kissinger himself. As is customary, tonight's program will include an address by our Kissinger lecturer, Madame Christine Lagarde, followed by a conversation with Margaret Brennan, CBS News senior foreign affairs correspondent and host of Face the Nation. At this time, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Carla Hayden, the 14th Librarian of Congress. Good evening, Madam Lagarde, members of Congress, and distinguished guests. We are deeply honored to welcome to the Library of Congress tonight, Christine Lagarde, Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund. As you can see, we are in the Great Hall of the Library's Thomas Jefferson Building, surrounded by visual art symbolizing the progress of civilization and the traditions of knowledge and learning, a most fitting venue for the eighth Kissinger Lecture. Madame Christine Lagarde is a distinguished public servant with deep knowledge of the world's economy and the ways financial architecture can shape the lives of individuals in countries around the globe. Among her many other high-ranking points in posts in government and the private sector. In June of 2007, she became the first woman to hold the post of finance and economy minister of a G7 country. Later, as chairman of the G20, she set in motion a wide-ranging agenda on the reform of international monetary systems. And on July 5th, 2011, Ms. Lagarde became the 11th managing director of the IMF and the first woman to hold that position. And on February 19th, 2016, the IMF Executive Board selected her to serve as Managing Director for a second five-year term. She has tackled some of the most challenging financial issues related to European integration, international trade, and the development of global economic governance. However, I am excited to be the person that will deliver breaking news. The room just got a little quieter. Well, today, Forbes released its 100 most powerful women in the world, and Madam Christine Lagarde was voted the third most powerful woman in the world. So, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Ms. Christine Lagarde. Thank you very much, 
Dr. Hayden, dear Carla, uh, for this generous and brief introduction. They are the best. They are the best. Uh, I'm so happy to see many of you here, my friends, and uh, very much looking forward to the discussion that we will have after these remarks with uh, Margaret Brennan. And thank you also, Mr. Haskell, for the uh, warm welcome that you have extended to uh, all of us. He could not be here tonight, but I had a, a conversation with him uh, just before arriving uh, at this beautiful Library of Congress. And Henry Kissinger was uh, delighted that we were gathering tonight, and he has asked me to express to all of you his uh, best wishes and, uh, and very uh, strong support for continuing the lecture that he started back in 2001. Um, I would also like to uh, indicate myself that somebody else is very much in our thoughts tonight, and that is obviously former President uh, George H. W. Bush and all his family members. We all mourn his passing. Many others are trying to uh, enter into the rotonda uh, as we speak, uh, and we celebrate the arc of his life. The pilot who bravely fought in World War II, the president who helped heal division after the Cold War, and the statesman, statesman who believed in the power of international cooperation. I hope to honor his spirit tonight, and I was privileged to meet, to meet him recently on several occasions up in Maine. And I could appreciate what a kind, generous, and noble man he was. So tonight, tonight is December 4th. It's actually an important date for a particular reason that I will not mention to you now. You'll have to wait until the end of my remarks. And you're not allowed to look at your cell phone, please. No. I have to confess something here. When I walked into the Great Hall and was given a lovely private tour by you, Dr. Hayden, three thoughts crossed my mind. The first one was this young French student who was studying for her political sciences dissertation back 42 years ago and who spent quite a little bit of time in the reading room. Thanks to the courtesy of the Library of Congress, I was able to better research the work that I did on Ralph Nader and the American consumerism of those days. Thank you. I'm in your debt. The second person whom I thought about was my son, who is a young architect. He would love this place. He would love it. The space, the height, the creativity. And the third thought I had was about my country, France. And maybe another country, actually, that I was just visiting a couple of days ago, Argentina. Now, why is that? Well, when this structure was completed in 1897, the chief engineer remarked, I quote, that the Palais Garnier, the Paris Opera House, was the prime suggestion for the new Library of Congress. That makes sense, actually, because the Paris Opera House was completed 20 years earlier in 1875. Now, I think the French may have borrowed a little bit from others because Théâtre Colonne in Buenos Aires was itself finished in 1857. And if you look at these three buildings, well, it tells you something. First of all, that valuable intellectual property was of great interest across borders, even back then, at least among architects, who happily borrowed from each other, learned from each other, became inspired as a result. Second, it reminds us that they understood that building something lasting means linking the solid foundations of the past with a spark of imagination. You can't just copycat. That kind of creativity and long-term vision 
rooted in history and informed by our successes and failures from the past is my theme for this evening. First, where have we been? How has creativity in international economic cooperation helped bring more prosperity and more peace in the world? And second, where can we travel together? How can creativity and informed visionary thinking help adapt the international system to our current challenges? So let me begin first with a little bit of shared history between the International Monetary Fund and the United States over the last 75 years. In the first half of the 20th century, the dominant economic and military powers used force to assert their self-interest at enormous cost in terms of human life and physical destruction. The tragic results compelled nations to find a better way. It only took them two wars and atrocities along the way. But in 1944, they found it. The United States emerged as the major global power and did something unprecedented. Informed by the devastating ultimate outcome of the Versailles Treaty at the end of World War I, of which we just celebrated the 100th anniversary, the United States decided to use its power in the service of cooperation. It was an experiment that would shape our modern world and in his inaugural lecture in 2001, Dr. Kissinger called the innovations of the post-war period, I quote, a great burst of creativity that brought security to the world. How did the US do it? Out of generosity? Yeah. With consideration to their self-interest? Yes. And with a little help from some of their friends. Let us look at that turning point of 75 years ago. And think first of the creation of the Bretton Woods system itself. The principal architects, John Menard Keynes of the UK and Harry Dexter White of the US, were deeply influenced by the period between the two wars. They witnessed a moment in history when flawed domestic policies poisoned international relationships, which themselves were built on troubled foundations, Treaty of Versailles. The result was protectionism and competitive currency devaluations. Imploding world trade deepened the Great Depression and caused massive economic, financial, and social upheaval. Ultimately, these pressures gave rise to nationalist and populist movements and eventually catastrophe. Emerging from the Second World War, the US and some other 40 countries gathered in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire, and decided to create the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. They tasked the fund with three critical missions promoting international monetary cooperation, supporting the expansion of trade and economic growth, and discouraging policies that would harm prosperity. It was revol revolutionary, it was visionary, and guess what? It worked. From the very beginning, the IMF helped countries address major new challenges through collaboration. Complementing the Marshall Plan, we at the IMF helped Europe rebuild from the rubble of war. Our loans gave countries breathing space to stabilize their economies in difficult time and implement policies to promote growth. It is a mission that we continue to this day. As you may have recently seen in countries like Argentina, Egypt, Ukraine, and many others. The genius of this collaborative system that they invented was that it was design, designed to adapt and change. And in the early 70s, that change arrived. 
Some of you might remember that speech, a landmark speech. The challenge of peace. President Nixon suspended the US dollar's convertibility into gold. And that decision shocked the world and forced a year-long negotiation that led to the modern floating exchange rate structure. Away from the fixed gold reference structure, moving into floating exchange rate structure, system that is still today in place in many corners of the world. But at the time, some thought that this particular change would mean the end of the IMF. But all our members at the time, including the United States, knew that the goal of stability and prosperity extended well beyond fixed exchange rates. They recognized the benefits of a global financial firefighter that could help countries in times of need. They built on what worked, changed what did not, and they adapted. And we moved on. 1973, the oil crisis, the IMF created new tools to help countries facing an energy emergency in line with the fund's role, to help smooth shocks and prevent harmful spillovers. As a debt crisis hit in hit Latin America in, in the 80s, the IMF, with creative ideas and support from the United States, stepped in to calm the waters. And after the fall of the Berlin Wall, we took on a new challenge, which was helping the former Soviet Union bloc nations transform themselves from centrally planned to free market economies. In the 1990s, the fund assisted countries in overcoming first the Mexican peso crisis and then the Asian financial crisis. And throughout all these challenges, we continued to help countries around the world with their economic fundamentals their fiscal, monetary, and exchange rate policies, and with steps to build stronger economic institutions. Because without that macroeconomic stability, growth cannot prosper. These efforts enabled better policies that opened markets, boosted trade, created jobs, and unleashed economic potential. And then came 2008, and the financial crisis, the global financial crisis. Most of the other crises that I have referred to applied to particular regions. This one was the first of a completely global nature. The ensuing Great Recession reminded us that international cooperation was essential, not optional. And as the French finance minister at the time, I certainly participated in that exercise. All G20 nations and the Federal Reserve took extraordinary steps to save the system. As veterans, when we sort of come together, we just wonder how we did it and how much we transgressed and had to violate many principles and rules and just reinvent. But at the time, the IMF deployed its own firepower, committing over $500 billion to help secure the global economy. And in the decade since the 2008 financial crisis, we supported economic programs in 90 countries and adapted our lending instruments, including zero interest loans to help low-income countries. But the global economy did not only need liquidity, and stimulus, it also needed to reform its financial architecture. And we worked with our membership to build a stronger financial sector so that we could together limit the consequences of what will be one day the next crisis. So we learned from the past, we got creative and we changed for the better. And none of that, none of that would have been possible without the United States. This country challenged the international economic order when it needed challenging. It forged compromise when compromise was necessary. Why? Why did it do all that? Benevolence? It did so because a stronger and more stable world paid dividends for the United States. It enabled the US to enjoy some of the longest runs 
of sustained economic growth the modern world has ever known. Since that meeting at Bretton Woods nearly 75 years ago, real US GDP increased by a factor of eight. And the average American's real income has quadrupled. And this success did not come at the expense of other nations. On the contrary, this country's collaborative leadership paved the way not only for decades of opportunities here in America, but also for growth that spread across the world. Now today, that landscape is shifting again. And part of this change is driven by geopolitics and the shift in some economic power from west to east, part of it by the rise of non-state actors, including multinational organizations and corporates. Part of it is driven by technology and the rapid acceleration of everything in our lives. As I'm sure you know, Dr. Hayden, 90% of the world's data was created just over the last two years. Now, I have to say, as a daughter of two classics professors, I know my parents would have found that very, very depressing. <laughs> but the truth is that everything moves faster. Information, money, disease, you name it. And these transformations can bring enormous opportunities, but they can also create massive risks. Why is that? Because more than ever before, at least as was demonstrated in 2008, what happens in one nation is going to impact all nations. From weapons of mass destruction to cybersecurity to the interconnected financial system, many of our current challenges recognize no borders. So when support for international cooperation falters, we must remember the lessons the United States and her allies taught the world over the last 75 years. It's a big lesson. Solidarity is self-interest. And that principle endures in our changing world. Our challenge now is to yet again adapt and reform. So I believe that this year, 2019 can be another turning point in our journey, a moment when the world delivers a new burst of creativity in solving our shared challenges. Actually, there's something up there that you can't see, but from which we can draw inspiration. Correct me if I'm wrong, but it's something like, they build too low, those who build beneath the stars. It's written up there. Imagine what the world could be if we were to build beneath the stars, the dark scenario as I call it, or the age of anger. Let's imagine the age of anger. By 2040, inequality could exceed the levels of the Gilded Age. Strong tech monopolies and weak governments with ineffective domestic policies could make it impossible for startups and entrepreneurs to succeed. Health breakthroughs could allow the richest to live past 120, while millions of others would suffer from extreme poverty and disease. Social media would bombard the left behind population, underscoring the disparity between their reality and the possibility of a better life and the aspiration gap would fuel resentment and anger. Trust between nations would break down. The world would be more interconnected digitally, but less connected in every other way. International cooperation for the benefit of all would be a concept best studied in libraries like this one, but rarely practiced on the world stage. Due to the supremacy of national interest and a singular focus on domestic policies. To borrow from Dr. Kissinger's world order, we might be, I quote, facing a period in which forces beyond the restraints of any order determine the future. 
That is a very dystopian scenario, isn't it? Not one that we desire, and certainly not one that I believe can and should be our destiny. Neither does Dr. Kissinger, for that matter. We have overcome existential threats before, and we can do so again. Think of the world. If we make 2019 the start of a different kind of AI, everybody thinks, oh, she's going to talk about artificial intelligence. No. Age of ingenuity. This would be a future fueled by creativity and cooperation. Okay, 2040, I'm in a new scenario now. We would see flourishing economies predominantly running on renewable energy. Women would be fully empowered in the workforce, proving to be an economic and social game changer. New pension systems and healthcare portability would reflect the changing nature of work in the digital economy. Corporation would embrace social responsibility as part of their business model because they would be rated on that basis as well. Technological wizardry could save lives and create millions of jobs. We would see an end to mass migration. Trade would expand across the world and peaceful coexistence between nations would prevail. Am I being too optimistic? Of course. You know the difference between the optimist and the pessimist? They're both wrong, but the optimist is happier. <laughs> so I have to be optimistic. Because I'm thinking about the world my grandchildren will inherit. But it presents us with a fundamental choice. Stand still and watch discord and discontent bubble over into conflict, or move forward, reimagine the way nations work together and build prosperity and peace. Okay, nice words. What does it mean in practice? It means countries working together to put people, all people, at the center of all our efforts, focusing on real results to improve their lives. It also means governments and institutions being more transparent and accountable, which includes listening to more diverse voices. It means ensuring that economic benefits of globalization are shared by many, not just a few. I call that the new multilateralism. You might just call it common sense, if that word suits you better. But let me be very clear here. Good international cooperation is never going to substitute for good domestic policy. And of course, individual countries have the responsibility for the well-being of their citizens. In fact, strong domestic policies can form the foundation for effective international cooperation. And in our modern world, there are some issues that can only be addressed through international cooperation. I want to discuss four such issues. I promise I'll be brief on each of the four, but I think they're all important. And to be successful in delivering on those four, we will need creativity and we will need cooperation. Let me start with those, the first one. First one is trade. I've been saying for some times now that we need to fix the system. More recently, I've been urging countries to actually de-escalate trade tensions, and it was encouraging to see over the weekend some progress made at the G20 meeting in Buenos Aires. And we must continue the de-escalation while at the same time improving the trading system for the future. That would include eliminating distortionary subsidies, whichever form or color they take, but agreeing on what they are. It would also mean protecting intellectual property rights without stifling innovation and getting rid of economic rents. New trade agreements could unleash the potential of e-commerce and trade in services. And all of this is critical not for the sake of trade, although Montesquieu would argue with me. And he would say, where there is trade, there is good manners. Is he right? 
Montesquieu is always right. No, it's critical because trade lifts productivity. Trade accelerates innovation, and we need both. Second issue where we need more cooperation is international taxation. Companies now have worldwide presence, even when they're small. You know, in the old days, you had to be one of those top guns to be international. Now, very small companies can be very international companies. But governments have not figured yet a worldwide answer to tax. And right now, too many tax dollars are left on the table thanks to tax optimization and the bad kind of creativity. So countries need to work closely to get together to collect what is owed, where it's owed, and avoid a race tax to the bottom. They can close the loopholes that lead to what is called base erosion and profit shifting. We are working with our partners so that our members can share best practices and devise regulation for a digital economy in which many companies have no single established base of operation, and yet they do operate. Why do we need this? Why do we need revenue? Well, because all countries should be investing in their future, and public and private funding working together can strengthen infrastructure, improve education, and prepare all of us to adjust to the technical transformations of our doorsteps. When the return on those investments is so far away, it's very unlikely that private sector alone will actually invest. My third issue is our climate. From the recent major hurricanes in the Caribbean to the wildfires in California, to the sinking islands of the Pacific, the dangerous effects of climate change are becoming more tangible by the day. A new US government study shows that the economic impact from climate change could significantly reduce America's GDP in the coming decades. The collaborative agreement reached in Paris in 2015 is probably the best toolbox that we have to start fixing the planetary challenge and move towards a zero carbon economy. It also reflects some of the ideas that I've tried to highlight tonight. Creativity, visionary thinking, and a global commitment to the common good that serves self-interest. This is a matter of survival for future generations. Now, I've mentioned three issues. Trade, tax, climate. And each of them is worthy of their own Kissinger lecture. But there is one issue that I believe is the bedrock for progress nearly everywhere else. And that is why the fourth and final area I want to discuss is good governance free from the shackles of corruption. The simple fact is that without confidence in our institutions, none of the change we seek will be possible. So let me focus on that briefly. It's my fourth and last key point. Why is corruption so corrosive? Well, because when people start believing the economy no longer works for them, society no longer works for them, they start disconnecting from economy and disconnecting from society. Corruption saps economic vitality and siphons off desperately needed resources. The money that is diverted from education and health perpetuates inequality and limits the possibility of a better life. Do you know what the annual cost of bribery alone, and corruption is more than just bribery, but the cost of bribery every year is 1.5, is estimated to be at $1.5 trillion. That's roughly 2% of global GDP. Millennials feel the problem acutely. A recent survey of global youth revealed that young people identify corruption, not jobs, not better education, but corruption as the most pressing concern in their own countries. There is wisdom in this insight because corruption is the root cause of many of the economic injustices that many of these young men and women are facing. And that is why, with the support of our entire membership, we are going to scrutinize anew the impact of corruption on a country's macroeconomic health. 
So far, we've done quite a bit of work on anti-money laundering and combating the financing of terrorism. We've done that with 110 of our country members, but it's only a small part of the wider work that is needed to promote good governance. Investing in institution is indispensable, as is indispensable, scrutiny to verify that those institutions actually deliver. Because likewise, corruption knows no border. Think for a second how fintech is changing the economic game. New innovations, including cryptocurrencies, crypto assets, can be used by cyber criminals to funnel illicit financial flows and fund illegal activities on a worldwide basis. This is not one nation's problem or within one nation's power to resolve. It can only be fixed through cross-border collaboration. But it is fixable because the same innovations that create cross-border challenges can also be used to help us fight back through biometrics, blockchain, and more. We can find creative ways to build a better, safer system for the long term. Governments can and must work with the world's best engineers to build stronger cybersecurity systems that protect people's bank accounts, their well-beings, and even their hotel bookings. This is common good that we must choose to support. And if we take, if we take the challenge of corruption as the model of cooperation that we can actually implement, it can be a model for the other topics that I've mentioned. It can be the sign that the brotherhood of man, as Keynes called it, is ready once again to meet the call of history. Except, by the way, at this time, women will play a role. <laughs> you should have seen the photo of those who created Bretton Woods in 1944. 44 men. Full stop. So I think it's by doing that that we can start restoring trust, which is probably the most precious and most in-demand commodity in our society. And this is how we begin to adapt once more and reimagine that international cooperation that we need. Now, before I conclude, we have one more thing to do. I began my remark by mentioning that December 4th was an important date. Now, there's one person who is not allowed to answer that question, that's Mrs. Harmon, who is the president of the Woodrow Wilson Center. Because on December 4th, 1918, exactly 100 years ago to this day, President Woodrow Wilson set sail for France to help negotiate what he hoped would be a lasting peace. He became the first, US, the first sitting US president to travel to Europe. And in some way, some ways, we can trace the origins of modern creativity and visionary thinking in US foreign policy to this date. It's also a humbling reminder that our plans do not always work out as intended. But it is also a signal that we must try and try and try again. We must build on what worked, change what does not, and continually evolve, improve, imagine a better future for all people. It was the vision that inspired the leaders of this country, and it must be the mission that will guide us in the days ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Madam. Thank you, Madam Lagarde. And uh, without further delay, I want to welcome to the stage, please join me in welcoming to the stage, Margaret Brennan, the moderator of CBS Face the Nation. Thanks to all of you, and what a gorgeous venue to have this conversation. Um, and I'm privileged to have it today. Um, 
you know, at, at your introduction, you were, it was pointed out that you were named one of uh, the third most powerful, I believe, between Theresa May and Chancellor Merkel in terms of most powerful no. women. <laughs> but I think the correction needs to be made is that you're actually one of the most, most powerful individuals in the world in terms of some of the work that you have done to stabilize the global economy. Um, and that's why I think uh, you laying out your vision as you had, there are a lot of things that we want to sort of break apart here. Um, let's start off with what's happening today. Uh, you're seeing recession fears come out once again. It was a bad day in the markets. There are some who looked at what happened at the G20 and said there wasn't progress. You said you saw some. How do you define some progress? Where is the hope that you're seeing? Well, I, I might be a little bit biased because I was um, also attending previously the G7 leaders meeting in Canada and then the uh, APEC uh, meeting in um, Papua New Guinea. And at the G7, there was um, a reneged communique. And at the APEC meeting, there was just no communique. People could not agree on anything. So the fact that leaders agreed on a set of principles, issues, um, uh, points. The fact that there was that was in a way reassuring. Any so that's, that's not any agreement. I think it was probably not as, as strong as some expected it, but it really touched on uh, many critical issues. The language was not exactly according to uh, sort of the history of communique drafting, but there was you know, positive news coming out of that. Uh, there was clearly a consensus around the fact that trade was critically important. Tra trade had to be conducted according to rules set by an institution, the WTO, that had to be reformed. There was a clear uh, agreement on, on the principle of reforms. How it will be reformed is going to be another matter, and I think it's not going to take, um, you know, a few weeks, but probably more months than, than weeks. And um, there was willingness to engage on the part of, of all. And Saturday night was not such a bad, uh, a bad outcome. Mm -hmm. You mean in the meeting between Xi Jinping and President? Yeah. yeah. 90 days, is that enough to come to some sort of trade agreement between the two largest economies in the world? Oh, I'm not sure that you know, the, uh, the objective is a trade agreement. But if at least there was uh, significant progress and a framework under which they agreed to move forward and to uh, uh, address some of the key issues, I, I, you know, I think what's clearly important is to come to an understanding on both sides, to agree on some key principles, to have uh, definitions of you know, what is a subsidy, uh, what warrants uh, intellectual property uh, right protection, uh, and, and uh, what is a state-owned enterprise, and, and so on and so forth. So it is complicated, and it is going to take time, but the willingness of these two presidents to move forward and uh, to agree to discuss those issues, I think, is compared with what we have just gone through, is progress, yes. So the nervousness that we're seeing in the markets, you're saying, look, they're talking. It yeah. is a positive. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. enough. And you know, we, we can't just um, react on, 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 a, on a daily market variations. Uh, these things uh, take time. Markets get jittery and, and, and react sort of off the cuff on, on the news of the day. But I, I think those are you know, much longer term issues that warrant time, thinking, considerations. And you know, it's, it's also a clear shift that we are seeing and uh, which is being acknowledged and, and will turn into, I hope, some resolution. I think it was, in listening to you sketch out going back to Bretton Woods to the present, I think it's a good reminder to many people that the US was part and parcel of creating many oh, of these international yes. institutions because now they, in our daily political life, are, are described or at least felt, perceived by some, to be against U.S. interests. That is how some of the more populist rhetoric has described institutions like yours. Today, uh, in Europe, the Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, listed all of 
what he felt were the flaws of international organizations and saying that even the IMF has sort of failed to live up to what it was meant to do, which was to rebuild Europe. He said now austerity measures, the things that are, are doing are actually hurting the world, not helping it. Hmm. What did you make of his speech and that description? Well, first of all, I did not read his entire speech. I saw bits and pieces uh, picked up and, and uh, you know, I will very, uh, very carefully um, read his speech. But, you know, I, I've heard this austerity comment made in, in many instances. And when we are called upon to help a country that is in, in, in very dear financial difficulties, we have to restore stability. We have to restore public finance discipline. We have to uh, empower the authorities with financing. That's one thing we do. But we are also uh, an instrument of macroeconomic sanity. Because if we're called upon to act, it's because there was uh, mismanagement, there was poor public finance uh, uh, organizations there was poor monetary policy. For multiple reasons, the situation was not in order. And we're trying not to bring austerity, but to bring order. Uh, so that's number one. Number two, if we did not come in to help, the situation would be even worse. Because what happens is when a country calls for help, we come in, we do expect that public finances will be uh, uh, you know, redisciplined, reorganized, and that uh, stability will result, at which point investors come in and say, okay, now the situation is, is, is stabilized, we can come back and we can invest. Mm -hmm. So if we did not do that, they simply would not come in uh, at, at that point. So I, I think it's, it's, we're not the, uh, the merchant of austerity per se. We are merchant of trust in the stability of a system that is needed in order to attract investors, generate growth, and you know, entail creation of jobs. And, and that's, we are the enablers of that. You, you called out for a kind of collaborative leadership, yeah. particularly from the United States. In because that is what has worked. You know, when, when I look back and when I, I consider the history of the United States' role, its involvement, what has worked, how it has worked for this country and others, that collaboration has, has proven extremely efficient. Well, the Secretary of State today said the administration is working to refocus the IMF and WTO to promote more pos prosperity, halt lending to nations that can already access global capital markets, and reduce taxpayer handouts to development banks that could raise capital on their own. That's his vision. That's the, mm. the vision that he describes the U.S. should be implementing right now. What do you make of that proposal? Because it was delivered in Brussels, and it ruffled a few feathers. Well, you know, on the point of uh, making sure that private capital can invest, that's exactly what we do. Uh, it is because private capital has completely lost interest in certain countries. You know, when I look at um, you know, the, the three that I've mentioned, Egypt, Ukraine, Argentina, why did we come in? Because nobody else wanted to come in, because there was not a single investor who was prepared to take the risk of going in because the situation was in disorder, because public finance were not properly managed, or because there were external factors that created massive instability. So we come in and we enable the country to become attractive again. So it's not as if we were a substitute to private sector investors, mm -hmm. investment. We are the facilitators of that investment because otherwise they won't come. They simply won't come. Too risky for them. Once they know that we are involved, it means that we put in place you know, debt sustainability. If restructuring is needed, we ask for it. Uh, if uh, new monetary policy needs to, to be implemented, we recommend it, and it's, it's implemented with some success, I, I, I dare say. <laughs> so I'm not sure that he understands very clearly uh, what, is, what is, well, the, our mission is prosperity. And yes, this is, this is uh, what, what the initial founders 
actually tasked us to do, and that's, that's what we need to do. So these descriptions of the vision and the leadership that America is providing on this front, for you it is not achieving what, what you were saying is needed to meet the crises right now that you see. Well, the, I was curious about the taxpayers' money because you know the, the, we've actually always paid back and more. Mm -hmm. So over the course of time, the United States has actually made quite, quite a bit of money out of the IMF involvement in countries. You think there's just a fundamental misunderstanding or are there portions of truth to these criticisms? Well, the fact that um, growth must be generated as a result of our involvement is something that I completely agree with. Uh, it doesn't come overnight because you need to you know, restore the situation, you need to sort out public finance, you need to reorganize uh, sometimes you know, through structural reforms the economy. But growth ultimate, it ultimately comes back. When I look at, I'll, I'll tell you, you know, as, as French finance minister, we had to deal with some difficult cases in, in, in Europe. Mm -hmm. But when I look at a country like Portugal, the involvement of the IMF was critical in turning the situation around, in sorting out uh, quite a few difficult issues. Portugal is now doing pretty well compared with other European countries. Mm -hmm. When I look at Ireland, Ireland is thriving. These are countries that needed those are countries where we had to come in as the IMF, we had to put in place significant lending programs, and we expected serious measures to be taken on the, uh, on the fiscal front because there was too much fiscal deficit run, and because the fun, in the case of Ireland, because the banking system was completely out of control and had gone way too far into expanding beyond the country. Mm -hmm. So, you know, th this, uh, these programs have clearly generated a growth. When you use that phrase, you know, describing we could live in an age of anger, mm -hmm. you're putting a timeline out decades from now, if you look at some of the, the forces, not just in the United States, that contributed to making trade a very contentious issue during the 2016 campaign on the left and on the right, but also what you're seeing in Europe, in your home country of France right now, mm -hmm. protests around um, the economy and specifically the gas tax, I won't get into President Trump's tweet about it tonight, but generally speaking, aren't you seeing those forces of anger? I mean, you were seeing more populist governments come to power or at least use the economy and anti-multilateral -institu anti institutional rhetoric mm -hmm. in a lot of places right now. Yeah. That, that is Are that we is in that correct. age that you're describing? I mean, where are we, we in this are, time we are, we are at risk of slipping into that, uh, that kind of, uh, of age of anger, which is why it's critically important to actually address those issues. And uh, I was, as I was trying to explain in, in my remarks, those are not issues that can be addressed purely domestically. Some of them have to be addressed domestically. But when it comes to trade, to tax, to climate change, uh, to cybersecurity, uh, to corruption, it has to be on, a inter on an international cooperation basis as well. They, mm -hmm. they come together. Um, but yes, and there has to be a response to those issues because many people are not satisfied with their income, are not satisfied with their future, have this anxiety of what the future holds for their children, and, and it, all these concerns need to be addressed and need to be addressed by societies at large. The challenge there is that lack of trust in the institutions that are tasked yep. with this or have been yep. tasked with this. You mentioned your time when you were Minister of Finance in mm -hmm. France and clearly one of the most difficult time periods you could have that job. And I remember from covering it that famous story of, of you speaking to then Treasury Secretary Hank Paulson and, and advising him against allowing Lehman Brothers to go under. Yep. You foresaw the domino effect. Did you see, did, did you draw a line between what you predicted then and where we are now? Is that where this shift began that you're laying out? I certainly did not anticipate that at the time. But looking back, yes, I think that there is a lot in today's anger, resentment, frustration uh, that is actually attributable to the legacy of the crisis. Uh, I think that 
we did a reasonably good job in trying to uh, strengthen the financial system, avoid that people actually lose all their savings and that there be bank runs all over the, 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 those countries. But I think the fact that we address the issues of institutions of the financial system at large without doing probably enough explanation as what it meant for people mm -hmm. um, and the fact that many involved in those, um, in those financial deals uh, got away with it and managed to reestablish themselves, I think created a sense of impunity. In other words, some of the lower middle class people thinking to themselves, okay, I've lost my job, I've lost my house. And those people, what have they lost? Their bonus? Yeah, but that's about it. And they reestablished themselves. So I think this, this, this is not at the root of and the only component of the frustration and the, the, the anger that we see, but it's certainly participating and fueling it. So That's how, what I call the sort of untold story of the legacy of the crisis. So how do you address that, then, if that age of anger is simmering? I think it's, you know, in a way it's too late to go back to things that should have taken place at, at that time. But we also have the possibility with new technologies, a digital age that is clearly in the making at the moment and at an accelerated pace, to organize it in such a way that it is transparent, that it is accountable, that it includes people, that they're brought into that digital picture by being properly trained, educated, skilled, and that they don't feel this um, emasculation that you have when something is so alien to you and so foreign to you that yet again you feel that anger about it. You want another Bretton Woods type summit? There, there are so many groups that are thinking about, oh, let's have another Bretton Woods, let's just reform. I think it's... it's who, who leads this? Oh, there are multiple leaders everywhere. <laughs> you know? They don't have to do the job of you know, giving advice, right. drafting and preparing those programs and providing technical assistance around the globe to 189 countries. But you know, the beauty of, this, of the institution that I have the privilege to lead is that in its articles, in its foundations, are the seeds for constant transformation. What, has, what is changing massively around it uh, calls for probably a different uh, approach. I think that the, the digital economy in which we are moving, which is transforming the financial sector, which is transforming uh, the, 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 uh, the existing relationship between value and monetary um, cost, all that needs needs new thinking. I think it's more new thinking than a reform of the Bretton Woods system. Mm -hmm. I know the IMF has, has written on this and talked about demand for cash decreasing. Yeah. And you know, money itself is changing, not just how yeah. we think and talk about this. You mentioned fintech in that context, fin financial technologies and all of the various forms of it. I mean, where there are advantages and there are disadvantages, these days it seems to be not very well understood, mm. even by the public at large. How much more of this needs to be led, not by the IMF or these organizations, but coming from the corporate world, coming from Silicon Valley? You have these hearings on Capitol Hill, and the joke is, you know, you have these CEOs come up and answer questions, and the individuals asking them don't even know how to use the websites that they're talking about. <laughs> You know, I mean, how do you regulate cryptocurrencies? How do you talk about all of this in a way that actually leads to some kind of regulation or reform? Well, first of all, I don't think that it should be entirely left in the hands of those corporate sector mm -hmm. representatives or their legal departments uh, or their public affairs uh, because they are dealing with a common good. They're dealing with your privacy. They're dealing with your data. Uh, and they're dealing with, with, with your freedom. So uh, governmental authorities, parliamentarians have to be involved and they have to 
be helped along the way for those who are not computer literate, for those who feel completely alien to these digital transformations. They have to be helped by, including by people by, like us, the IMF, in relation to financial uh, technology beca technologies, because you know we, we try to, to grasp what it means, how it's formed, how those technologies are used to shorten the circuits, to uh, uh, enable payments, and to include people mm -hmm. uh, that were not including in the not included in the banking sector, for instance. So, it it is a, a, a public responsibility, and it has to be done again in cooperation with those engineers, in cooperation with those who understand the future of data protection, who understand you know how cloud will eventually you know be accessible or be readable and and hackable. So there are many technicalities that you don't master, that I don't master either. But you know, having enough knowledge to understand the key principles that need to be respected is something that I believe fall on the shoulders of, uh, of parliamentarians and, and members of government, because they today have the responsibility to represent the people. You've also issued a number of calls for some of those parliamentarians to get rid of the legal obstacles to inclusion of women yep. in the economy. Yep. Where does that begin? What's the it very often begins at home. Um, of the 189 countries that are members of the institution, about 90% still have in their constitution or in their legal system discrimination against women, uh, barriers to their participation in the economy, uh, to the um, inheritance um, when parents die, uh, to the owning, owing, owning a business, to the opening a bank account, to being able to bring collaterals when they try to have a, a loan. So I think that that's where the work has to begin. And we have demonstrated in many countries, or observed in many countries, such as you know, some Latin American countries like Peru, some African countries as well, that when those changes happen, it actually has consequences uh, on the economy and it, it pushes growth and it, it, it enables women to become uh, better integrated uh, into into the economy, but it's not only that. It, it begins there because there should not be legal barriers and legal constraints uh, imposed by uh, by governments that prevent women from playing their role in the economy. How much of an economic benefit is there? How do you quantify? It? Huge. You... It's huge. I mean, it, it it varies from in you know if you look at the Nordic countries, uh, you know Norway uh, being clearly a, a, one of the best performers, Finland being very good as well. But from those countries to, say, uh, India or Saudi Arabia, you can have an increase in the economy which varies from 3% to 27%. So that's nothing to be, you know, sort of turning your eyes away. It's pretty big. Why the resistance? Ha! Huh. If you can make the argument on numbers, why is there such resistance? I think you're talking about something that goes much, much uh, deeper into culture, into psyche, into um, the way in which uh, societies have been built over the course of time. You're also talking about the divide between urban centers and rural areas. Uh, you know, India, India is a case in point where clearly in rural areas, in particular women, are, are, are prevented from uh, joining the flow, from being economic partners, and, and sometimes from having access to sanitation. Bigger picture, because um, I know we're running out of time here. I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about Brexit. <laughs> and what this, we were talking about the forces sort of pulling at the global order right now. It's, that's a rejection of international organizations and, and solidarity there. Add that in to what you're seeing here in the U.S. as well in terms of that kind of rejection. I mean, it sounds like you're trying to swim upstream. You know, it's, first of all, I think that the situation has changed and is changing in the U.K. When I look at the latest poll that was uh, produced, uh, the, the, the shift is now into a majority of those polls. Now, you can, you can you know, turn surveys and polls in whichever way you want, but it seems that there are more Brits who would rather remain than exit. So, number one. Number two, 
I think a lot of the campaign that took place at the time, um, two years ago now, um, was geared towards watch out, the foreigners are going to take you know, uh, your meal away and they're going to have, uh, they're going to go first in the health benefit and the healthcare system and they're going to take jobs. And it was the fear of the, um, the foreigners. Um, unfortunately from within Europe and it was directed at uh, people from Poland, from Bulgaria, from Romania uh, who by the way have been extremely well integrated in say the German economy um, as was demonstrated recently in a country that needed additional skilled labor. Mm -hmm. So that fear factor that was raised by, during the campaign uh, may have completely uh, missed the opportunity that that particular flow of migration actually produced in an economy next door, which was Germany. So that's a little bit beside the point, but um, I think there is regret in many, many European corners. I think there is more regret in the UK than there was only, only six months ago. And I think there is now the realization that there will be more loss as a result of Brexit than was ever mentioned, described, accounted for by those who campaigned for the Brexit. Um, I can say that with, with um, relative comfort because when we produce the Article 4 for the UK, which is the annual audit that we do of all economies, we did actually give, uh, we did give at the time three scenarios of Brexit, one of which was the baseline, which was pretty much in line with what everybody uh, assumed, but another one which was a dark scenario, which is very close to some of the numbers that we are seeing now. The dark uh, scenario. In terms of forecasts coming up in, in case of a Brexit development or, and in case of a no-deal Brexit, mm -hmm. which is what we had considered. Is that a warning to brace ourselves? I think it was, it was a very clear uh, you know, assessment of what the consequences would be as a result of a no-deal uh, Brexit scenario, where you know, the terms of trade between the UK and its main economic and trade partner, which is the European Union, would be done under the WTO rules with no additional sweetener to WTO rules. Well, the dark scenario is a, is a scary phrase to end on, but unfortunately I'm told that we are... Oh, no, but you know, there was something very interesting today, which is the Attorney General opinion delivered to the European Court of Justice. Mm -hmm. So for those like me who would very much like to keep the UK within the European Union, there is apparently a, a perfectly legally acceptable way to revoke the Article 50, which is the provision under which uh, the UK pulled out. You think that's a viable scenario? It's, at least it's legal. I'm a reformed lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is the optimist that you described yes. yourself as. Yes. Here. <laughs> Thank you so much, Madam Mugger. Thank you. Thanks to all of you.